This morning on Wake Up With Hope, Jesus 101 will be with us to share a morning devotional. We'll have a dedicated prayer session and a special feature on weathering emotional storms. Join us. Good morning, friends, and thank you for waking up with hope. You know, we're excited to be here and waking up with you. <laughs> On this bright Tuesday morning, we hope to bless you today yes. through our program, and we pray your heart will be filled with the joy and peace of Jesus today. Mm. You know, today is National Gorgeous Grandma Day. Yay! Yes. <laughs> you know, all grandmas are gorgeous, and today we celebrate. We celebrate the special grandma in your life, reminding her just how beautiful she is inside and out. That's right. Our kids have two wonderful grandmas and today mm -hmm. we want to challenge you to go the extra mile and spend some additional quality time with your grandma. Take her for a walk, a bite to eat, or simply spend time with her. You know, grandmas are special. We truly hope you take time to think about, remember, and be thankful for the one God gave you. If she no longer is with us, well, take a trip down memory lane and remember all the beautiful things you shared together. And if you're a grandma, remember that you are beautiful and priceless. And so let's begin this morning by taking a look back at what took place on this day in history. On this day in history in 1996, at the Summer Olympics in Atlanta, Georgia, the U.S. women's gymnastics team achieved a historic milestone by securing its first ever team gold medal. Known as the MAG-7 or Magnificent 7, the team consisted of seven exceptionally talented teenage gymnasts, Amanda Borden, Amy Chow, Dominic Dawes, Shannon Miller, Dominic Mochianu, J.C. Phelps, and Carrie Strug. The team carried the weight of national expectations, seen as America's strongest chance yet for Olympic team gold, a feat never before accomplished by U.S. women's gymnastics. Prior to this victory, the best American finish had been a silver in the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics, where the favored Soviet Union, winner of eight consecutive team gold medals from 1952 to 1980, did not compete due to a boycott. And just as these athletes face daunting expectations and fierce competition, we too face challenges and trials in our walk of faith. You know, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 encourages us. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily ensnares and entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. You know, and as we do this and rely on Christ's strength to overcome obstacles, we can achieve the victories He has planned for us. Amen, that is so true. While life often throws curveballs, many times unexpected, how can we weather the emotional storms that come at us? Let's find out on today's episode of The Incredible Journey. When a crisis looms or drops in your lap, how do you cope? Do you get angry? Do you panic? Do you pretend it's not happening and hang out at the beach with your friends, ignoring the social distancing recommendation? It's easy to have an emotional response to the circumstances around us that is as natural an act as breathing for every single one of us. The difficulty lies in bringing balance to our emotions so they don't consume us. Combining our emotions with reason and judgment is something that all of us struggle with. Sometimes our brains are so strongly conditioned to a certain emotional response in a given situation that we react without thinking. But the ability to manage our emotions well can make a huge difference 
in how we view the circumstances we find ourselves in and also how we respond to those circumstances. Let's look at two Bible characters, one who was overwhelmed by his emotions and another who successfully managed his. Both were placed in highly stressful situations and yet they had completely opposite reactions to an almost identical situation. Our first Bible character is the prophet Elijah. His story is found in the Bible book of 1 Kings, beginning in chapter 17. Elijah was instrumental in leading the people of Israel away from idolatry and back to God. His iconic showdown with the priests of the pagan god Baal on top of Mount Carmel was a significant turning point in the spiritual direction of the northern kingdom of Israel under the rule of King Ahab. But Elijah incurred the wrath of Ahab's wife, Queen Jezebel, who was an ardent follower of Baal and instrumental in introducing the cultic worship of this idol, this false god, to Israel. Incensed by Elijah's blatant defiance of her God and his worship, Jezebel threatened to kill Elijah. Terrified at the prospect, Elijah turned tail and ran. He ran all the way to Mount Horeb, where God met him and asked him a simple, poignant question. What are you doing here, Elijah? God had just given Elijah a tremendous victory on Mount Carmel. He had demonstrated his power before the entire nation of northern Israel. And yet, despite this, when Jezebel threatens him, Elijah gives way to his fears and runs. Elijah's response to the threats of Jezebel is a classic example of how our emotions can overwhelm us and strip us of our ability to reason. If Elijah had been able to manage his emotions better, he would have been able to think through his situation more rationally. He would have remembered how King Ahab had hunted him for three years and how God had kept him safely hidden during that time. He would have remembered how God had sent ravens to feed him while the rest of the land shriveled under a horrific drought. But he didn't remember any of this. All he could think of was Jezebel's threat and his fear was so overwhelming that he ran. Without thinking, Elijah ran when running should have been the last thing on his mind. On the other hand, remember the story of Daniel and how he was faced with a similar situation but reacted completely differently? Daniel woke up one morning to a knock on his door. Daniel chapter 2 details how King Nebuchadnezzar, incensed by the inability of his wise men to tell him about a dream he had had, orders that all of them should be executed. Being one of the king's wise men, but also completely unaware of the situation, Daniel is informed early one morning by the king's executioner that it's time to die for something he hadn't done and wasn't even aware of. But Daniel doesn't run. Instead, he is calm. Surely he must have been afraid, or at the very least shocked. But he manages to control his emotions enough to ask intelligent questions and understand the situation. Once he has a clear grasp of what is happening, he must have realised how impossible the situation was. No human being could possibly comply with the king's absurd request, but he still doesn't panic or give way to fear. Instead, he asks for time, calls his friends together and prays, asking God for a solution to his problem. And God answers him and provides just as he has promised. Daniel is able to go before the king and tell him his dream and the interpretation. If Daniel responded to the situation as Elijah did, the outcomes might have been very different. Managing our emotions in times of crisis is crucial. When you're faced with an overwhelming problem, remember three things. One, stop. Don't jump to conclusions. 
Two, ask questions. And three, turn to God for solutions. If you do these three things, chances are you'll end up like Daniel, victorious and in control of an otherwise impossible situation. Friends, did you know there is power in prayer? Prayer is a most invaluable gift given to us by the creator of the universe. This morning, we wanna take hold of that powerful gift and pray together. The Let's Pray team is here to lead us out in a special prayer session. Shall we pray? Hi family, it is that time again to get together and pray. Um, I'm really appreciative of these times because I know that there is power when we come together in the name of Jesus. And today we're going to be talking about, praying about really, strength to get over addictions. There's a verse in Jeremiah that says in chapter 17, verse 14, Heal me, Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved. For you are the one I praise. This is such a beautiful scripture. It speaks faith and hope, and that's exactly what I want to pray for us today. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the opportunity to pray over this community, Lord. And I include myself in this prayer as, as you know, Jesus, 16 years sober, Heavenly Father. But that does not mean that I have not needed your strength to get over things that I habitually do or habitually find um, strength from that don't come from you, Lord. I consider all of these things to be addictions, Lord, when we're searching for anything that is not you for our rest, our peace, our strength, our hope, and our relief, because that's what so many of us are looking for, Jesus, it's relief. So Lord, I pray that folks would not only have the strength <clears throat> because of you to get over their addictions, Heavenly Father, but Lord, that you would indeed help them to focus so intently upon you, Lord, that those things fall away. Because Jesus, if you heal us, Lord, we'll be healed. When you save us, Jesus, we are saved, for you are the one, Lord. You're the one. You're the one we need. You are the place to go. You are the safe place to be vulnerable. You are that place, Jesus, that isn't going to overwhelm us or force yourself on us, Heavenly Father. These things are so important that you are always, always helping us to walk in freedom. And I pray in the name of Jesus that freedom, Jesus would begin to consume the lives of those who are seeking it. Jesus, that you would break the chains of addiction over those who are struggling against them. And Father, that you would not only help them to move away from those things and towards you, Jesus, but that you would actually dry up their sources. Jesus, if it's gossip that we're addicted to, if it's worshiping our own emotions and making them more important than the truth of your word, if it is, Heavenly Father, drugs or narcotics or shopping or gambling, whatever it is, Heavenly Father, we not only seek to be free and to be walking in fullness with you, Jesus, but Lord, we're looking for your relief, for your refreshment. So will you teach us how to find those things in you and not in destructive patterns? I thank you that you're not wagging your finger at us. You love us right where we are in our mess, but you do call us higher. You do have more for us. You are our advocate. You're not spying on us, judging us, Jesus. You see all things and you still love us. And I'm so grateful, Jesus. I'm grateful, Father, that you are moving on behalf of this community and those that we love. I thank you, Jesus, that you're moving in my family and the families that are represented here. We praise you, Jesus, for being the answer to all of our needs, our struggles, and our hopes. And I thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I pray that it's a blessing for you. I pray that the Lord would continue to give you hope and perseverance. If you yourself are dealing with addictions or if those you love, remember he's able to reach them. Even if it's not always through us personally, he's able to surround our loved ones and our family members and us with the help that we need. My prayer is that we would be looking for it and he loves to be found by us family. So be encouraged today and I look forward to the next time we get to pray together. 
If you're finding today's program worthwhile, don't keep it to yourself. Share us with a friend or visit our website at hopetv.org slash wake up for more. And check us out on YouTube to subscribe to our channel and keep up with us. We'll be right back with today's devotional thought from Jesus 101. Welcome back to Wake Up With Hope. We are so thankful you're with us this morning. It's now time for a devotional thought. This morning, it'll be brought to us by Jesus 101 Ministry. Today, we conclude our mini series on Fear Not, and we are discussing Fear Not The End. Sometimes we are afraid of the end of the world. What's, what's gonna happen? How is this gonna happen? And Jesus actually gave us beautiful portraits of himself for the end of times so that we wouldn't be afraid. Is it possible to choose faith over fear for the end, the end of the world, the end of our lives? Yes, it is. And today we're going to discuss it. There's a big word that perhaps you have heard is eschatology. Eschatology is a word that means uh, the study of the end times the last days, how we study what's going to happen, the prophecies, things like that. And today we are going to discuss why is it that we should not fear the end or even talking about eschatology, the end times and the study of the end times. We have a book at the end of the Bible called Revelation. This is the last word of God uh, that we have in the Bible and it is about the end. It is about eschatology. And why is it that we shouldn't fear it? So let's go to Revelation chapter 1. We are going to spend a little time on chapter 1 of Revelation today. And one of the first things you notice on chapter 1 verse 1 is the word revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ. This is how this book starts. The revelation of Jesus Christ. This word revelation is actually the word Apocalypsis. That's why um, we hear of the apocalypse and things like that. It seems like Hollywood is very interested in making movies about the end and the end times, even though they usually don't follow what the Bible says. And um, this word apocalypsis means unveiling. The very beginning of the book says uh, God is going to unveil Jesus Christ, because yes, we knew about the cross from the Gospels, but we didn't realize what this meant for the end of times and for the whole world and for the whole universe for that matter. So if you think about unveiling, think about a piece of art. You know how sometimes we have pictures or, or sculptures that they're going to be unveiled. That's the word apocalypsis. And so here at the very beginning of the book, Revelation 1, 1, the apocalypsis of Jesus Christ is the unveiling. And it takes the veil off and it says, ta-da, we know how the story ends and Jesus wins. So we don't not only have the cross, but we have a crown because we realize that Jesus is king and he's coming back as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So, and we can summarize the whole Bible in two words. Jesus wins. I wrote this devotional to, to help people understand how we already know that Jesus wins. We know how the story ends and Jesus wins. So this is the unveiling. And it tells us this is what um, is going to happen at the end. Jesus will win. So when we start this book, which is a last um, word of God for us. Uh, we have beautiful portraits of Jesus. And today I want to discuss uh, a couple of those portraits with you. The first is chapter 1, verse 5. Chapter 1, verse 5 tells us something about Jesus that is important to understand when we start the study of the end times. Verse 5 says, From Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. And check this two Check out these two verbs. To him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. So the first verb was loves us. I know that some translations haven't done it in, in, in uh, the present tense, but it is in the present tense in the Greek. So Jesus is the one who loves us and loves us and continues to love us. It's like a present continuous tense. And then released us. That's past. That's why we have a, a, a cross here on fear not because it already happened. He released us. He's freed us from our sins by his blood. So these are the two things you need to remember when you start this book about the end times is that he loves us and loves us and continues to love us and 
that he has already released us and freed us from our sins at the cross. So then we start on verse 7. Behold, he's coming with the clouds and every eye shall see him, even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be amen. And then we get the first portrait. We have portraits of Jesus for the end of times, for the eschatology, the study of the end of times, some very specific portraits of Jesus. And the first one is the one on verse eight. I am the alpha and the omega. I'm the alpha and the omega. Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. So if Jesus were talking to us today, he would say, I'm the A and the Z. I am the first letter of the alphabet. I am the last letter of the alphabet and all the letters in between. There's nothing you're facing that is not covered um, with, by these two letters, A and Z, the first and the last, the whole alphabet, C for cancer, D for divorce, F for financial problems, P for pandemic. <clears throat> it's all included in the A to Z. I'm there at the beginning, says Jesus, and I'm there at the end. And just in case we didn't get it, verse eight continues and it says, uh, um, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. This is what I call the multi-directional assurance. If what you're afraid of is the past, he says, I'm the one who was. If what you're afraid of is the present, it's, he says, I'm the one who is. And what if you were uh, afraid of the future, he says, I'm the one who is to come. It's a multi-directional assurance covered by from the A to the Z. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, it brings me so much assurance. And he continues, uh, verse 17 and 18 of the same chapter. He repeats why we should not be afraid. And here's the fear not or do not be afraid command. Verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet, says John. Uh, and he placed his right hand on me. The right hand is the powerful hand of God in the Bible. And he said, do not be afraid. Fear not. Do not be afraid. Why? Because I am the first and the last. And this word last in Greek is eschatos, where we get this big word eschatology. Jesus says, if you're going to talk about the last day events, make sure you're talking about me because I'm the last. I am the first and the last. So if you're going to talk about the end of the world, the end of your life, whatever it is, the end, don't forget to talk about me. I'm the last. I'm the first and the last. I'm the eschatos, says Jesus. I am the living one and I was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death. I have the keys of death, says Jesus. So the multi-directional assurance covers the whole thing from beginning to end. So fear not the end, fear not the end. You know, uh, this verse where it says he has the keys of death uh, inspired me to put a key inside my parents' tomb when I buried uh, my dad, who was um, the second parent to die for me. And I put a key inside their tomb and then we closed it. And I know there is a key there that Jesus will find when he comes for them on the second coming, because I believe that Jesus has the keys to death and will wake him up again. So fear not the end. Jesus is the beginning. He is the end. He is the eschatos. And the whole Bible ends with this reminder that he is the first and the last. Look at Revelation 22, verse 13. I am the Alpha and Omega, again, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And then he ends the whole Bible saying, yes, I'm coming quickly. Oh, amen. Jesus is coming back for us. Fear not the end. The one who has died for you, has assured you that he will be there at the very end. So fear not the end. Jesus is with us from the beginning to the end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and amen. Amen. And friends, thank you for spending time with us this morning. And if you would like to learn more about our program or share us with a friend or even watch some part of today's program, again, visit us at hopetv.org slash wake up. And don't forget to wake up with us tomorrow morning. We'll have music and Pastor John Bradshaw will have the devotional thought for us. Plus, we'll have a delightful cabbage salad recipe and another episode of Masterstroke. We hope you join us. And if you enjoyed today's devotional thought, 
God and would like to learn more about the scriptures, visit hope.study to receive your free Bible study guides. Again, friends, that's hope.study for your free Bible study guides. Check out the website. We're sure you'll be blessed there as well. Now, our program today is over, but before we go, we want to leave you with the Bible promise. And it says, And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 3, verse 15. Mm, what a beautiful promise. We have been given the Holy Scriptures to know all that we need to know for salvation. You know, friends, God's Word is mighty to save. Open His Word today. You know, make it a point to study His Word daily and consistently because He has promised to make us wise unto salvation. Amen. We've had a wonderful time on today's program, and we pray you have truly felt God's love and care for you. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you so much. Your word has given us strength and encouragement. We're ready to face this day. And we pray, Lord, that you would guard our hearts, that nothing would take away the seed of, of hope that has been planted in our hearts may produce the most beautiful and greatest fruit in our lives. So thank you, Lord, for answering our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.